Welcome to Cardium, the podcast that gets to the heart of travel healthcare and asks, what's your why? With each episode, we explore the topics and issues that impact healthcare professionals in the fields of nursing and allied health. Now, here are your hosts, Sunny and Matt from RES Medical. Hey, Sunny, how are you today? I'm doing great. Good. Well, you know, jumping into the t- today's topic, it's a different one. It's it's something that we've not spoke of before, but it is on the forefront of a part of our healthcare industry. Yeah, it's very exciting in a way, but it's definitely causing waves in the healthcare industry right now. Yeah, waves of good and maybe a little bit of unrest, I think. Yeah. I think there's a lot of unknown out there and... And I think today's podcast will at least shed a little bit more light than I for sure know about it. And PDPM, it's even hard to say, <laughs> the the patient-driven payment model. And and I, I don't know how much you know about it, but I know how to say PDPM. Yeah, I know how to say PDPM. Um, I don't know much about it. Um, I know that there's a lot of um, concern, unrest, um, but also a lot of people that are just wanting to know information. And I think... Um, We've got um, two excellent guests on the show today that's going to be able to provide us a little bit more. Yeah, fortunately, our audience is not relying upon us to to know a lot (laughs) about PDPM, but we brought in a couple people that that I think will, again, shed some light on it and be able to offer some real good insight. And and hopefully by the time the the podcast is is out there, um, we we have a little bit more information. So with us today, um, Ellen Strunk. Ellen is an experienced leader in the field of physical therapy and has worked in various roles and settings as a clinician, manager, and director. She's the owner of Rehab Resources and Consulting Incorporated, which specializes in helping customers understand payment systems in the skilled nursing facility and home health settings, as well as outpatient therapy billing for all provider types. Ellen lectures nationally on the topics of regulatory compliance in the post-acute space and other clinical-related topics within the rehabilitation therapy world. Ellen is a member of the American Physical Therapy Association, the American Healthcare Association, and other professional organizations within her specialty. She's an expert in the patient-driven payment model, PDPM, otherwise known as, and we're excited to have you have Ellen here today. Ellen, welcome. Thanks, Matt. I appreciate being here. Yeah, thank you for joining us, and, and we're excited to have you here. Also joining us today is Angie Kolosik. Angie brings expertise from the staffing and recruitment perspective of healthcare. She's currently the Division Manager of Rehabilitation Therapy for Arias Medical Group, which places healthcare professionals in hospital, outpatient, skilled nursing, and school settings. Angie has been dedicated exclusively to the specialties within therapy her entire 12-year tenure. She utilizes her knowledge of PDPM to effectively support therapists and help facilities best meet their workforce requirements. Welcome, Angie. Hi. Great to be here. I'm yes. excited. Yeah, yeah. We're mm-hmm. glad to have you. Yeah. So welcome to both of you. And I, I think that we're going to jump in because we, this is a big topic and, and it's it's a big deal. So let's get started. Well, Ellen, first, I'm going to give you a question that I think everyone just needs to know. Give us an overview of what PDPM really is. So the patient-driven payment model is um, developed as a means to move the skilled nursing facility payment system from a system that rewards volume of services to a system that more recognizes patient characteristics. So, for instance, today, um, a, a payment for a skilled nursing facility is pretty much determined by whether or not how many minutes of therapy are delivered, number one, um, and if no therapy is delivered, then it would be based on what nursing services are delivered. Now, we know because CMS has uh, pointed this out to us many, many times over the last few years that um, over 90% of all of Medicare days are paid in a rehabilitation rug. Therefore, they believe that the system is incentivizing people to provide a lot of therapy rather than taking patients that may have more medically complex needs. So the system basically um, looks at various various patient characteristics. It looks at functional mobility impairment, self-care impairment. It looks at what is the primary reason for the skilled nursing facility stay, whether or not the patient has a cognitive impairment, whether or not they have a swallowing disorder, um, and then what are their multiple comorbidities or special services that they need. So in essence, it, it, is, it is determining the payment rate on all those things and how much therapy is delivered has nothing to do with how a facility gets paid. Okay. And I do have a quick question that just came to mind. So, you know, 
being a former caregiver, I, in a different realm, I was thinking of back in probably the late 80s, 90s, and you probably know the time frame of utilization review when that came out. And so tell me the difference between PDPM and utilization review. Well, it's, um, you know, I, obviously utilization review can take several um, several forms, but I would say the primary difference is that there is no, um, there is no, you know, kind of pre-review process. It is basically that um, once the, you know, that the, the MVS captures all of these pieces of information and calculates what a payment is, and then it is up to the facility to determine what services are needed. So, for instance, they can decide that if a patient has a swallowing disorder, whether or not they need speech therapy and how much they need. Okay. Um, there is no requirement that they have to deliver anything. Now, of course, that all um, that all is based on the on the premise that the provider is, um, has a responsibility to provide those services that the patient needs, and they will be monitoring some of the quality metrics to ensure that uh, the patient outcomes don't suffer. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's really interesting, Ellen, and I think. You know, from from you and you alluded to this as you're describing PDPM, and I think there there's going to be a lot of our audience that really that want to know from a the patient side of things how will this impact patient care and and you know is this a positive in your view is this a positive move for the patients who will be receiving the 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 care in the facilities there? Sure. Um- a lot of it does, you know, depend and rely upon the intent of the provider and how well the team collaborates. So the patients that have been to a skilled nursing facility in the last year or two, um, they may recognize the difference, honestly. If they had, say, a total knee last year and they came in and, and now they're having a total knee this year and they come in under PDPM, they may a um, slightly different look of their physical therapy, their occupational therapy, their speech therapy. Hopefully, they will see more collaboration um, and less, um, less. Uh, which, how should I say this? Less emphasis on the number of minutes provided. So, for instance, um, today under the RUG system, if a patient isn't feeling well or has um, has some, some trouble, maybe uh, tolerating or participating in. A, 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 you know, an hour of therapy on the first few days of their stay, um, they, you know, there's, there's, a, there's an incentive to kind of um, try to get that patient to participate regardless because you, you need to meet a certain number of minutes per week in order to get the payment level that you think is appropriate. Under this model, that, um, that incentive no longer exists. And so, again, if a patient is not feeling well or if they need time to adjust to the environment, then there's less pressure to get in there and give them therapy that may not be the best thing for them on that day. So, yes, there are, um, there are concerns that the amount of therapy delivered will be cut back and so that the patients won't get as much. Um, but I think as therapists, we, um, we need to really be out there advocating for our profession, and I think it is our responsibility to make sure that the patients deliver the right amount rather than letting someone tell us that they they don't need as much therapy just because it's October 1st, 2019. Yeah, that's that's actually, I mean, when you describe it like that, the, the positive side of the patient care really sounds intriguing, and I think that's what most therapists are concerned with is that they want to make sure that their patients are taken care of, and I love that fact that that when you when you describe the positivity side of things, that patients may in fact be have a better delivery of the care that they need uh, instead of trying to go towards the towards the required minutes. Right. That's really interesting, and I, I think that that's you know again that's industry wide. We talk a lot on our podcast about the contract travel side of the world, and I, I think Sunny that it doesn't matter whether you're a, a permanent healthcare provider or that you are in the travel industry. I, I think this matters, and you know that's. That leads me to asking Angie, you know, how do you think this will impact the travel industry? There's a lot of unknown, as as Matt said, and we've uh, 
received a lot of feedback from directors uh, to HR to our current therapists at working and uh, have done a lot of research on our own. And really, it's going to impact that there are going to be a lot less uh, contract needs within those major cities. In general, too, there's going to be less skilled nursing needs. And for a therapist, in order to be remain competitive, it is going to be that going outside to some more of those rural areas in order to ha- still have their travel career uh, be robust. And then, but also, it's just that getting experience in other settings as well will really help them out substantially. Um, we're already seeing some effects that uh, the reduction in our skilled nursing needs. However, um, you know there is a clause to that that speech therapy has remained strong. And I know Ellen can probably shed some more light on uh, as to uh, why that is. But it it is going to be, there is a lot of unknown, but um, we do know uh, for sure that there are going to be less skilled nursing needs out there. Ellen, do you foresee, you know, I always think that there's always these changes and I'm going to refer back to how utilization review came and there was like this big, oh my gosh, you know, is this going to impact funding? Is this going to impact changes? Um, Are people going to rely uh, more on POS? Things like that when I was a mental health therapist. And so, um, so it was a little bit different, but looking at how this field is, do you see see that there is going to be a bounce back and that, you know, life goes back to normal and needs um, go up because obviously um, patients still need care. Right, right. Uh, You know, I, um, it, it remains to be seen. I hope that we will not see like, um, you know, I hope that we won't see a huge change in, um, the, the therapist um, uh, positions like we saw 20 years ago when the Balanced Budget Act went into place. Um, I don't, I was not, um, was not practicing then, but, um, but I have heard that, you know, many people in the skilled nursing facilities were laid off um, significantly and there was a huge, um, huge drop in the number of therapist positions. There, there have been, you know, as was alluded to, some, some decrease in um, the number of therapists, the number of PRN therapists um, out there. And so I do think that there will be, I like to call it perhaps some right sizing, <laughs> um, because again, with um, when you are struggling to get a certain number of minutes a week, then everything, you know, revolves around capturing that within that time period, which means that if a patient was unable to achieve their minutes during the week, you've got to get weekend staffing in there to, to do it. Um, if you have admissions on a Friday, you've got to get therapy in there over the weekend to get them started on therapy. Um, minutes grow that. Now, you know, again, in, in, in my rose-colored world, um, patient needs now would drive that. So if the primary reason the patient is there is for therapy, and therapy is the one skilling them, then they still should be, um, you know, in that, um, in the facility over the weekend and doing that therapy. But again, it kind of, um, it kind of depends on the provider to recognize those needs and, and do the right thing. Um, so, so that's my first hope is that number one, we don't have a huge drop like we did in years past, but that we have more of, of sort of a right sizing. Now, um, CMS has said that they are going to continue to, you know, look at the data, um, analyze the data. So they will be watching what providers do. Yeah, I mean, everybody out there should be well aware of that. And if they see that lots of therapists are, you know, that lots of therapy minutes are dropping off and, and providers react in a way that, that they did not anticipate, then they will do one of two things. One is they will rearrange what they pay. And number two they um, could go look at certain providers. So I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not totally convinced that there's going to be this this, this sudden uh, decrease in therapists and then in a couple of, um, in another year, we'll see a sudden increase. Hopefully we'll begin to see, um, you know, therapists going to areas that are more difficult to serve. Um, hopefully we'll see therapists where maybe they've only had PRN staffing because they couldn't hire anybody Maybe we'll see therapists be able to be hired there so that rather than having these pockets of area areas where you have so many therapists and others where you have so few, you know, uh, maybe we'll see some more leveling. 
Help, help me understand, too. So with this change, um, are we going to see um, patients in or residents in skilled nursing homes move more towards a group therapy type care? Is that correct? Oh, wow. Um, there have been concerns about that. So what Medicare did is that, that, that we've always had a um, 25% limit on the amount of group therapy that could be provided in skilled nursing facilities. So that will exist today. However, um, it is um, the two things. One is that since those minutes count towards your threshold that you're trying to achieve, then, um, then it is harder to achieve, it is harder to get to your threshold when you use group therapy. So without going into all the math, that's the bottom line. When you use group therapy, it, um, it, it doesn't necessarily help you achieve your threshold any sooner. The other thing that made it hard to deliver is that the definition was so strict. You had to have one therapist to four patients exactly, and they all need to be doing the exact same thing. So in some nursing homes, that's hard to hard to mm-hmm. set up. You know, finding four people that are all can do the same thing, all sure. have similar characteristics and conditions, that's hard to do. So yeah. in this new PDPM model, they um, they modified that definition and they changed it so that it's not one to four people. You can have anywhere from two up to six patients in a group which really provides more opportunity for therapists, especially in smaller facilities, to um, to, to use group when it's clinically appropriate. And, and they did that because they wanted to make the definition, you know, similar to other settings. And so they feel like that this will put us on par with inpatient rehab facilities and with outpatient facilities. So I think it will make it easier for therapists to, to utilize it because now if I, you know, I can do a group of two people. And then plus the fact that you're not, you know, struggling to meet a threshold of minutes every week, then um, then that might make it easier. And um, and and you know, from an operator side, I, I, I'm not going to be naive. Of, of course, um, when you have one therapist providing minutes of treatment to two, three, four, five, six patients, then of course you are going to decrease your your labor cost. So I do think that we will see more group being used under this model um, again. It, we as therapists have to ensure that it is appropriate and that we're utilizing for the right reasons and not just using it on every single patient just because we can. Thanks, Ellen, for shedding some light on the group therapy. That was one of the questions I wanted to ask you. And um, and especially when looking at the number of patients per, um, per group therapy treatment. Um, you know, one question I do have for you, though, is, is what is – what is the perception out there with that change over more towards that that group therapy from the therapist's viewpoint? You mean the perception of the therapist and and how do you um what they think of group therapy? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Sure. Okay. Well, you know, I, I I will be honest with you. Okay, I have run across many, many, many therapists who have never done group therapy in their career. Right. So we have a lot of therapists out there because you think about this model, this drug model has been in place for 20 years. So you have a whole generation out there who mm-hmm. has worked in skilled nursing facility and they've never used group therapy either because their provider said, you know, we don't want you to use it. And they fell in step line with that or because they um, were never in, uh, taught how to use it. Uh, maybe that maybe they worked in smaller facilities where it just wasn't logistically feasible to get four people in a room at the same time. So that is a big problem that people don't know, number one, when it might be clinically appropriate, and two, how to organize and schedule something like that. So some therapists are um, just, just, you know, kind of um, ignorant to it. And so when you tell them, you know, you need to start using group now or, or you can, they say, well, I don't know how. The other thing, honestly, is that some people look at it as they kind of have a cynical view that, oh, group therapy is only going to be used because they want to decrease labor costs. So I have some run into some therapists who, who kind of had that, that bias about that. So um, I don't think either one is a good place to be in. I think that you should not be um, so 
cynical that you think that group therapy is only a way to decrease labor costs because there are some benefits to using group therapy. While we don't have a lot of research there to support functional outcomes um, directly to group therapy, there is research to show that it helps patients become more engaged, that perhaps it can help them, um, uh, you know, understand their, um, their impairments a little bit better. It can perhaps motivate them to want to improve by seeing others with the same conditions as them. Um, so certainly from that standpoint, it can help them to, um, to perhaps achieve a better outcome. But it's selection of patients and making sure that your groups are meaningful takes time and skill and is something that therapists need to learn. And can't you can't just walk into a, to a gym and t- announce to all of your therapists, hey, I want you to start doing group today without mm-hmm. giving them tools to do it the right way. Sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I bet that it will be a, a, a transition, especially for you saying that uh, there's a lot of therapists out there that don't have the knowledge of, of group therapy and have not been doing it. And, right. and um, I know that you can't give an exact uh, percent of, of this, but um, do you have a rough idea about how much of their day will be doing group treatments? Um, no, I, I really can't. And that's, okay. and that's why, I mean, obviously 20, you could, you could imagine that 20, I mean, if, if you just took a whole number and said, okay, well, CMS has said, um, DP, 20, up to 25% of my physical therapy minutes over this day could be delivered in group therapy. Mm-hmm. So, group four concurrent, I should say. So, theoretically, you could say that one quarter of my time would be. Um, now, I, I, you know, again, I, I hope that providers are going to be, um, you know, more thoughtful about that and realize that some patients will not be appropriate for group therapy at all. Um, and so, therefore, it should not be used just because you can. Um, and others, it may be that perhaps in the first week or 10 days, group therapy is not appropriate because they're too sick, they're too impaired, but maybe as they are getting um, stronger and as they are getting more functional, then towards the end of their stay, they might be appropriate for more groups. So you may find that in the first first part of your stay, you're doing none, and then in the latter part of your stay, you're doing more. So, you know, I, I, I hear providers, and I, you know, I hear many saying that they are going to try to build in groups. Um, some are saying, yes, that we will try to get up to that 25%. Um, so, again, those are operators. Those are businesses talking and looking at numbers, and I can appreciate the need to do that. But we, as therapists, we also need to make sure that we're doing the right amount, not just the max amount. I, I think just from an outsider looking in and not knowing anything, so just, you know, I'm not a clinical professional, so let's be clear on this. But to all of our listeners, um, you know, when I think of when I think of skilled nursing homes and the residents that are there receiving um, the and the patients receiving group therapy, I kind of think just from listening to the conversation that we're having here, that there's still a lot of unknown. There's still, um, but I'm starting to feel a little bit better because when I think of um, the group therapy model that we are, you know, might have to strive for a little bit, I think of, you know, these older patients having to have maybe a little bit more help because when I think of a group therapy situation, you know, they will need a little bit more support. You know, I can't think of one therapist and not having maybe an assistant or whatever because, you know, they're going to, there's fall risks and things like that that you have to consider. Am I wrong in thinking that? No, no, I don't think you are at all. Um, again, it's just a matter of, you know, what, um, what, what kind of um, personnel are you using to, um, to perhaps do that? So, you know, I know that um, a lot of businesses out there are looking at how they can collaborate more perhaps with a restorative nursing program or an activities department, um, again, so that they can ensure that patients are staying engaged throughout the stay. Um, as I mentioned, one of the um, one of the big things um, about the patient driven payment model is the fact that CMS is really going to be watching functional outcomes. And one of the more exciting things that, for me as a therapist is that we finally have four functional outcome measures 
that are being utilized in the skilled nursing facility, the inpatient rehabilitation facility, and likely in the home health in future year. Um, what that measure, what those measures do is they measure that CMS said it straight out. We are measuring the value of rehabilitation in these settings. And so, um, that, that, that data has been collected, uh, for about, um, almost two years now. And providers are beginning to see some of the results of that. CMS plans to post that publicly. So I think that in the midst of, um, this patient driven payment model, and looking at, you know, how, how therapy services might be, you know, reimagined and the implementation of more group. We cannot lose sight of the fact that M- Medicare is watching our functional outcomes. And if we can do that in a better, smarter way, fantastic. Okay. But we need to ensure that the tweaks we make to, you know, how we're, how we're delivering the service doesn't impact those functional outcomes. Yeah, that's it, it's just amazing how much that you that you've already unpacked for us today, Ellen. I, I think it's just there's just so much there. You know, I, I, I'm I, I I love to know how things started, and I think I think a lot of the audience would want to know: Is there something that happened you know, a couple years ago that really started started the the groundswell of we've got to have the P, the PDPM model? In place, is there was there an event? Was was it a was it something that was that was on the horizon that that everybody saw coming? Can you kind of give us a history of background to that? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I agree. I've always thought that you know if you understand a little bit of the why, then it's easier to swallow you know the medicine, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so yes, you're exactly right. Um, you know the, the Deficit Reduction Act of 2005, 14 years ago, actually, wow, was the first of legislation that told CMS, look, you've created a monster by creating these four different prospective payment systems in the post-acute care space. You need to really think about how to re-engineer this and come up with one payment model. So they embarked on a study and hired contractors, and and they actually did a demonstration. It was called the um, the post-acute care payment reform demonstration. And they did that between 2007 and 2011. And of course, it took them a couple of years to write the report, okay? But they looked at the report and it started circulating 2012, 13. Well, Congress got a hold of it and they were like, wow, this is very enlightening. We could really look at reducing costs in post-acute care if we started to, um, you know, put the systems more, more aligned, if we started making incentives be the same thing. So they essentially then turned around and passed Impact Act, the Improving Medicare Post-Acute Care Transformations Act in 2014. And that told CMS, look, you need to come up with metrics that will be the exact same in IRF, skilled nursing facility, home health, and um, the long-term acute care hospitals. And if you start having measuring sticks that are the same across all four settings, then we can develop a payment model that will be similar across all four settings. So that started in 2014. That's where our functional outcome measures came from. And now we have probably, um, you know, between 10 and 12 measures that are being done the same all across the spectrum. So in parallel to this, you have both CMS and you have um, MedPAC, which is the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission, who advises Congress on how much money is left in the trust fund. MedPAC is over there screaming to Congress, look, Medicare is going to go bankrupt. You've got to salvage this post-acute care space because the spending in this space post-hospital has just gone up exponentially over the last 10 years. So in an effort to try to get a handle on it, that's why they are developing these models. So they have implemented the patient-driven payment model here in SNF for October 1, and then right on the heels of it, uh, January 1 of 2020, Home Health is going to be going, undergoing the same massive change called the patient-driven blooper model, just as a teaser there. Um, and these two models are looking very much alike. And so, again, the, the working hypothesis is that CMS is developing these because that this will be the future of what is called a unified post-acute care payment model. 
So more change to come. Yeah, that's fascinating. And, and I, I think we're going to have to probably bring you back so you can talk a little bit about that. Too, I, I think our I think our audience are, will be really intrigued on the home health front. Yeah. You know, just to, to follow up, and you had mentioned this earlier. You know, to make future changes because yes, while the the you know t- the testing uh, um, has worked out, you know, you roll this out nationally, and inevitably there's going to be some some adaptation that needs to happen. You know, how how what's what's your confidence level, uh, and what will be done as far as making future changes, modifications to the model itself? Is that something that you're hopeful on? Do you think that, that that's a realistic expectation? Um, yeah, I hope they will make it. You know, obviously, I think a lot of it will have to do with okay, let's see, let's see, um, let's see how, what we feel. You know, six months from now, um, our payments to providers do they seem to be fair? Um, are there uh, are there loopholes in the system that you think people are gaining? Um, what are those pieces that are most important to collect? And what are pieces of information that we're currently collecting in the CMS that really are not informing our decisions? So, yeah, I do think that they will continue to make um, some tweaks, probably not big changes in the next few years, um, fundamental changes, but they will be looking at how much money they've allocated to um, all of these pieces of information. And there's actually 188 pieces of information that inform what your payment rate will be. And so do I think that they might, um, you know, increase the value of some and decrease the value of others? Absolutely. So that the payment rate continues to be tweaked. But as far as um, huge, huge modifications, in the future, too, I, I don't think that they will do that. Uh, that's interesting, and I think that that just goes to show. I mean, if you're confident, obviously, you're, you're, Ellen, you, you, you're, you're very knowledgeable about the topic. But it sounds like they are going to need to give it some time before they make any type of modification, just because of the size and, and the, the breadth of it. Ellen, do you see that the the home health changes? Do you foresee those being pushed back at all, or do you see January one it will rule out? I did a January 1 rollout um, primarily for two reasons. One is because I actually finalized the model last year in last year's final rule. And so that was, um, you know, October of 2018. They said, if it's January 1, 2020, we will be doing this. And so um, it has given about a year or more to prepare. Um, and then in this year's proposed rule that is out, actually the comments, um, on that rule, we're due September 7th. They, they did not pull back at all. So we tweaked it a little bit, you know, got some feedback, asked stakeholders for, for feedback on the minor parts to the model, um, but it's mainly to do with claims billing and the request for anticipated payments. But, uh, but no, uh, there is no, um, if, if anybody out there is thinking that they will push the positive they're probably um, fooling themselves. Yeah, you know people are put, are thinking that. <laughs> you, you know, you yeah, got you yeah. to believe that that's the case. But it, it is good, not, good to know that you that you are good to think that you believe that that's going to happen. And I think again, Ellen, if, if, if we're going to have to have you come back because I think that'll be a really intriguing topic as well. I'm going to change a, a little direction here. Um, when we're looking at um, the job market, what would you say are the most important takeaways for a healthcare professional in the field today? I mean, how do they position themselves um, for the job market? Fantastic. Um, I believe that therapists who are, how should I say this, um, working at the top of their game, I think therapists who have clinical curiosity, who want to understand the patient's health, not just the the problem that they came into the facility with, but understand the complexities of their um, of their of their medical conditions, all of them, I, that they understand, um, you know, our older adult population is very complex. They usually come in with, you know, half a dozen um, medical conditions. They're usually on multiple medications. So does a therapist understand the impact of those medications? Um, do they understand the impact of this event or this um, injury on um, everything else going on in their world? Do they understand how to modify a plan of care based on the social determinants of health? 
So essentially, is, you know, what is a patient's cognitive level? What is their um, educational level? What are they going home to? What kind of caregiver situation do they have? And then how do you modify your plan of care to address all of those things? But if I'm a therapist who comes in and I am kind of taking a Easter approach that every one of my patients is going to get five times, you know, let's just do a bunch of exercise and, and let's do some gait training and let's do some transfer training and all my goals look the same and I'm not taking into account all of those other variables, then I, I'm, that the, the, the flatter therapist, I think, will be challenged in this world. Um, the therapist who understands that, who, under, who is a good communicator and can collaborate with nurses and physicians and occupational and speech therapists, um, you know, that is the kind of therapist that I think will thrive in these models um, who aren't afraid to kind of be, um, you know, a, a patient navigator, so to speak, that you are thinking um, beyond just your um, your therapy plan of care under this roof or, or in the home, but you're thinking about next steps and you're thinking about how to make sure that the patient is empowered to stay healthy, then those therapists will succeed, I think, and thrive in, in this new world. So as an educator or someone who is in charge of running these clinical rotations for our student therapists, what would you say they need to be doing and preparing for these PDPM models? Because it's coming out, they're already in school, um, so there's not a lot of prep time. So what do they need to be doing now to get them ready for being out into the field? And those that are already in the field, what should they be so doing? I think that um, I think the biggest thing that they can be doing is, um, you know, helping them to understand that volume of therapy is should not be your primary driver. I know that many times we um, therapists come out and they say so many sometimes they may think more therapy is better. Well, more therapy is not always better. Um, good therapy is better. So helping them to really, um, you know, understand that relationship between dosing of therapy, intensity of therapy, frequency of therapy, um, helping them to understand how to um, measure their true outcome um, in things more than just level of assistance, um, and teaching them how to use standardized tests so that they um, understand, um, you know, really what is working, what is not working. Um, help you know, making sure that they're very strong in their critical analysis skills, um, being able to translate knowledge into practice, and then reevaluating um, what what happened, and then again putting more knowledge into practice by modifying perhaps a few things, and then reevaluating the effects of that. So really being able to um, to to do that kind of cycle of analysis um, on a day to day basis. That's interesting, and and uh, especially from that student's perspective. And when thinking about for PTAs and CODAs and how this will also impact them, what's your viewpoint on that? On how it will affect students? Um, for uh, uh, PTAs and CODAs. Um, PTAs and CODAs, I think, will um, continue to be a valuable part of therapy teams. Um, you know, there, there are some other threats out there on the horizon to um, and making making many assistants feel um, un- unsteady or um, a little bit anxious because of some payment cuts coming to the outpatient world for physical therapy assistance services um, in 2022. Um, so I, I think that um, I think that there is a lot of unrest for assistants. As far as their role in post acute care setting. I do believe that they will continue to be a valued part of the team. But again, their skill set and their ability to communicate and um, and be able to um, uh, you know provide treatments that are evidence based um, that they think about. All right, what kind of therapeutic exercise am I doing? And if a patient ha- and on the OTA side, if if a patient has an ADL impairment, is exercise truly the answer to this? Or is it is it more of a um, you know adaptive equipment and actually um, you know teaching and 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 breaking down the ADL task and and training it piece by piece rather than just throwing a bunch of body exercise at it 
like we've done in the last few years because in the last few years, it was all about how many minutes you got. That was the focus. Now our focus is coming to outcomes. And so the assistants have to be able to make that shift as well. Yeah, it's, that's that's fascinating. There is so much movement in the world, and and I think that there's you know there's a, there's going to be a lot of challenges on the horizon. I think you know it can be it can be viewed through a couple different lenses, and you know it's obviously the focus of patient care, and we love that. But yeah, there's there's a lot of moving parts of this, Ellen. You know, Angie, I want to I kind of want to pick your brain a little bit about specifically to the traveling healthcare professional world, and and what if you if you could. You know, given everything you guys have spoke about today, what are some immediate things to keep in mind from a tr- the traveling healthcare professional perspective? Some some short term, some things that they would really want to start considering now um, to adjust to to this to the model to the change. To adjust, I mean, one thing that that, that definitely comes to mind uh, is that um, to write out some of the bumps that that might come about um, from this is that you know extend out your your current assignment. I think that would be the um, best thing to do when thinking about for career wise and, and then, um, but also that, you know, for your resume and then everything that, that you have that is representing your strengths, fine tune that, fine tune that because you know, we, we may see that there is a lot more competition when it comes to, uh, submittals for jobs because some of those individuals that are going to be, um, in the skilled nursing setting might be flooding other settings. And, um, and really, um, besides sharpening your, your resume is that, um, you can also, um, for interview skills, make sure that, that you, uh, are practicing and then are updated on that. Yeah. It sounds like Mm -hmm. it, it sounds like the, the, just the open mindedness and the, the, the acceptance of change is, is probably some of the biggest things that you Mm -hmm. you speak about. And, And I think that the audience, you know, whether people know this or not, you know, there's just, there is a lot of demand and not nearly enough supply right now. But mm-hmm. so what you're saying is that you might see you 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 anticipate that there might be additional additional therapists available um, for for jobs that maybe otherwise weren't available, and that and that's why you would need to to kind of sharpen those those skills, as you said. Yep, yep. And then um, you know, for sure, it will remain a a candidate driven market, and sure. um, uh, there is a lot of jobs and not a lot of therapists. And, uh, you know, that is, that is not going to change, but yes, it will, it won't be as extreme as, as it is today. And, um, that, that might, uh, normalize down the road, but for the time being, for the short term, um, it's something to definitely think about. Yeah. That's fantastic. Well, Sonny, I learned a lot. I did too. I, I hope our too. audience did too. We are now at the favorite part of our show where we talk about our why and, and then we're going to start with Angie. We're going to ask you, and this is my favorite part. I know it's Matt's too. It is, yeah, I love it. <laughs> and this is where we ask, like, the purpose of why you do what you do. And so, Angie, what's your why? My why, um, you know, thinking about, you know, really why I come in every day, and you know, I do what I do. Um, now, some of you may know this, but uh, I, my, my brother was in a really bad car accident. A horrible car accident, and when he was younger, and um, and he received tremendous uh, help from his physical therapist, occupational therapist, speech therapist, and um, he would not be where he is today without that. And um, really, it's just that my my why is that you know helping bring quality care, getting these patients the 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 true care that they need in order to get back to their, their, their normal, just as, as, uh, my brother did. Yeah. When it impacts you personally like that, I, I, that's, that's, that's something that's near and dear to your heart. And, mm-hmm. and that's why we love to hear these whys because yeah. there's so much behind them. Yeah. There's so much behind them. And they're unexpected too. That's great. Thank you, Angie. Thank you. And now Alan, um, Purpose for why you do what you do. What's your why? Oh gosh, um, always, always good to kind of reflect on that, right? Yeah. So, I um, I had a very special relationship with my grandmother, and I always enjoyed being with she and my grandfather, and um, would spend a lot of time with them during the summers. And um, it was um, it was something that uh, you know, I treasured. 
when I went to physical therapy school, I really thought that I wanted to work with kids. But I realized after my first clinical rotation that that was not where, where I was cut out to be. And I then had my next clinical in a, in a school nursing facility, and I fell in love. And I think it was because of the special relationship that I had with my grandparents, with um, just appreciating their, um, their, their life stories. And I never get tired of listening to life stories. And I learn from patients. And so I just think that they are such... Um, such precious, you know, people. And, and so, you know, I, I can't really explain how I got to what I'm doing now, mm-hmm. except to say that I want families to feel empowered to help all older adults achieve their, their best. And that best looks different for, for every single one of them. Yeah. And if I, if, if I can help people understand, uh, payment models so they do the right thing, if I can help them understand, um, a patient's benefits, so that they don't cut off service because they don't think something's going to be covered, um, then I feel like I have um, I have made a difference. So I I just want to try to in whatever way possible, you know, provide um, provide uh, you know encouragement to therapists working with older adults and and that to make them realize that that it is a very special and a very um, a very hard thing. You know, people. Sometimes people think that that all therapists do in nursing homes are, is um, is go in there and just walk people around. But we are dealing with very sick, very sick people, very complex people. And so I know I've had the opportunity to change some tra- tra- trajectories out there, and um, and and it is a very um, very very good feeling. So that's that's kind of my why. Thank you so much. Well, Sunny, again, I learned so much, and Ellen and Angie. Thank you very much for joining us today. We hope we get you guys back on a future podcast to talk about some more changes. It sounds like we're not done with this uh, a bit of a yeah. roller coaster, folks. So hopefully you'll be able to join us in the future. And maybe we can kind of see how the model is working out with PDPM. And then some of the other changes that Ellen, uh, that you had mentioned are coming um, coming up in the, ne- in the coming months. I, if, that's, if that's something you'd both be interested, I think we'd love to have you back. Yeah. That would be great. Sounds great. Well, thank you both again. And I, I, Sonny, again, I learned so much. And I think I feel like this... I was in a college level course right now. And I am like, I hope there's not a test. Please, Alan, don't quiz me. On yeah. This. Yeah. I, oh, I'm glad we recorded this. So we <laughs> yes. can go back and take some notes. <laughs> take some cliff notes. On exactly. This. Well, it's been fun. That was a lot of great information that was shared. And we're going to share that information on cardiumpodcast.com, where we'll have show notes as well as other great resources. Bye bye, everybody. Bye. You've been listening to Cardium from Arius Medical with your hosts, Sonny and Matt. We're the podcast that gets to the heart of travel healthcare. To subscribe, access show notes, or to learn more, visit cardiumpodcast.com. C A R D I U M podcast.com. Or wherever you're listening, be sure to rate us, review, and subscribe. Thanks for tuning in. Until next time.